<clears throat> so the use of a Taylor polynomial and the, the approximations that you get that are um, that are the um, that are polynomial in nature um, really had a lot of use prior to um, us having calculators that had so many uh, non-polynomial functions. So if we look at the calculator here, we see a lot of non-polynomial functions. We see sine and cosine and tangent. We see things like natural log or log base 10. Um, all of those things are non-polynomial. And so, you know, there was a day and a time when all calculators did was add, subtract, multiply, and divide. And so um, those basic four-function calculators were couldn't do any of the, the trigonometric or logarithmic things that we do today. And so if we can get kind of an idea uh, looking back at um, sine of x. So I have the sine of x here in the, in the graphing calculator. I also have a polynomial approximation that has a fifth degree, a polynomial approximation which is a seventh degree, and a ninth degree approximation for sine of x. So um, this is a, my sine of x is my y4. Um, I've got a, a y1, a y2, and a y3 here. Um, this y1 is the uh, fifth degree polynomial that we looked at in the activity. Um, and then I have the, uh, the seventh degree polynomial underneath it, and I have the ninth degree underneath that. And so if we take a look at what this looks like graphically, <clears throat> we can see the first one graph is the fifth degree. So we've got a little bit of um, uh, a trigonometric function, maybe minus pi over 2 to pi over 2. That's pretty accurate. Uh, here comes the seventh degree. So the seventh degree looks like maybe it's pretty accurate uh, from minus 2 pi to pi. Or from, excuse me, minus pi to positive pi. Um, and then here's the uh, ninth degree coming through. And that ninth degree looks like it takes it out maybe another um, pi over 2. And then here is the, the actual trig function. So if we kind of look at that, then... Um, you know, we're looking at a, uh, <clears throat> a fifth degree here that here's the x to the fifth power, here is the x to the seventh power, and here is the x to the ninth power polynomials. And so they're, they're starting to kind of wrap themselves about this trig polynomial farther and farther out, the higher degree polynomial we have. And so, you know, Back in the day when, um, when we didn't have sine and cosine functions on our calculators, we would um, take those polynomial approximations and, um, <clears throat> and really just um, use those approximations to find the sine of a particular uh, angle. So if we kind of looked at the two tables here. Um, so this y1 being the fifth degree polynomial approximation, the y2 was the seventh degree, the y3 was the ninth degree, and the y4 is the actual trigonometric function, um, we can see that um, the actual trigonometric function for, for one radian here, you know, a radian is approximately 60 degrees, so for one radian here, a fifth degree polynomial is accurate um, for the first three decimal places. 
um, and it starts to diverge at uh, uh, at that fourth decimal place at that one ten thousandths. Uh, the seventh and the ninth degree polynomials are, are pretty accurate uh, all the way out to the ten thousandths place. Um, and so <clears throat> for two radians, okay, so if you think about two radians, two radians is about um, 120 degrees, you know, we're starting to get out into, um, you know, this is, this is pi over 2 and minus pi over 2, and this is minus pi, this is plus pi, right, this is pi over 2, and this is minus pi over 2. So when we get out to two radians here, <clears throat> which is about 120 degrees, you can see how the x to the fifth um, being 0.9333 is, is a fair amount off uh, of sine of x. So we can see that that x to the fifth that um, is starting to peel off here. This is the x to the fifth here. And that's starting to peel off. So at 120, we're, we're significantly... Uh, you know, at right about 120 degrees, we're, we're significantly uh, a, a different amount um, than the actual um, than the actual value of the function. And so if you'll notice then that as we go farther and farther away from zero, because this is centered at zero, this accuracy starts to diminish. So um, the accuracy the accuracy gets worse as we get farther and farther away from zero radians, um, you can see the accuracy is really bad. Here's the actual value at, um, at about four radians, so about um, you know, about 240 degrees. Um, and then the accuracy is, is really pretty bad. For all of them, we'd have to go out to a higher degree of nine to get pretty close. Uh, nine gets kind of close, but really not even that close. Um, you know, we're talking way out here at 240. So, um, so the idea is that, you know, it's a relatively short calculation. If all you need to be as accurate within the first 60 degrees, it's a relatively short uh, calculation to get pretty close by doing a fifth degree polynomial and putting in one radian for this. So if we would approximate at one radian using a uh, fifth degree polynomial, so we're going to use a, uh, this, is the, uh, this is the way we show the approximation. We do a fifth degree polynomial at one radian. That's how we would show the approximation. Then we would take this approximation, the x minus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the fifth over 5 factorial. And we would uh, substitute in 1 for one radian, oops, and uh, wherever you see x, and when you substitute in one radian for wherever you see x, you're going to get 0 0.84167. You're going to get this value here. Okay, so that is it. Looks to be about two ten thousandths. Uh, away from the sign, the actual value of the sine of x. So there is some error there. So you know, if we, if we have the actual value, we know that sine of one radian is 0 0.84147, and the approximation is 0 0.84167. Then we can say, well, we do have an error here. We can see that, and we can take the actual value minus the approximation at one radians to find that error. So if we look at that, um, if we subtract off that, then we're looking at 0 0.00020. It's actually negative, but we're just going to take the absolute value of that. Um, we just want to know how far away from the actual value we are. We're two ten thousandths away from the actual value. So that's not bad. Uh, it's a pretty quick approximation. So before the days of these of the graphing calculators and the scientific calculators where we had, you know, sine, cosine, tangent, we have things like a square root, we have things like a log and, and natural log. Um, you would literally 
have to plug in the values into this table to find the actual answer. Um, and, uh, and so what came about then is these books called trig tables and, and uh, logarithmic tables that literally were just the tables like you see up here with these values um, for different angles um, and then the value of the sign um, at that angle. So this is what we're going to be using Taylor and McLaurin approximations for, is we're going to be getting these polynomial approximations that are going to be uh, close enough to use for these trigonometric functions. So in this exercise, I want to focus on um, a, a function that's a little nicer from a calculus standpoint. Uh, we're going to look at e to the x. And so if we graph e to the x, looks you know, like this, where we have uh, this asymptotic behavior about the x-axis. So we have this point here at 0, 1. And, um, and so um, when we talk about then this behavior about 0, um, so we're going to really focus this about that x equals 0 or about the y-axis uh, and to get it to match that, that function in that area, then really what we're talking about is is the ability to match certain calculus characteristics. You know, so for instance, if we take a look at that function there, not only um, is it important then if we want to match the function in that area, not only is it important to match the value of the function, so definitely um, when we talk about matching a function in this area um, with a polynomial approximation, we want to make sure that the, we match the value. So in other words, if uh, the value f of x, um, if the value uh, at 0 is 1, then the value of the approximation at 0 should be 1. We shouldn't have a different value. Um, but not only should we look to match the value exactly, but we should also look to match the value of the derivative. Um, so that that value of the derivative, if, uh, <clears throat> if that derivative at, um, if the derivative at 0, has got a certain value, then the polynomial approximations derivative should also have that same value. Those should also match. And, um, and so um, if we take a look at that then, um, if we talk about the function here, so we talk about the function at 0, um, that's just plugging in e to the 0 power, which is a value of 1. Uh, and so um, when we talk about matching that value then, um, and uh, we are, we're going to approximate it here with a first degree polynomial, and a first degree polynomial is nothing more than a line, then, um, then we're talking about a polynomial expression that looks like uh, y equals mx plus b. And I'm going to write that a little bit backwards um, when we talk about approximations. Um, instead, when we talk about linear approximations, um, this is the equation of a line. Uh, the b is the uh, the term that has no variable, so it's the x to the zero power term. This is the first degree approximation because here's your first degree polynomial. So when we talk about Taylor or McLaurin polynomials, we typically write that in increasing polynomial order like that. And so we're going to call the b intercept. We're going to call that a sub zero. In other words, the value at um, at the beginning, the value of the function, um, and then the slope is going to be a sub 1 x. So we have this approximation um, that looks like that form. 
and um, <clears throat> so if we look at this value then if we're talking about the polynomial approximation at zero um, we can go ahead then and uh, we know that it needs to match this approximation so it needs to match the value one um, and so from there we can figure out the value of a sub zero so um, where this is a value of x equals 0, so if we solve this, we know we have an a sub 0 of 1. Okay, you know, and that's kind of the mathematical reasoning behind behind this. We, if we're going to have a, um, if we're going to have an approximation, we want to be sure that the value of the approximation matches the value of the actual function. Um, we also need to match the slope. So in other words, we need to take a look at the value of um, of e to the x here, and what's the slope of the tangent line at e to the x? Well, in that case, we need to, we need to take the derivative uh, of the function. So the actual function, the derivative of it at 0, is uh, the derivative is going to be e to the x. And so we're still, we still have the value of e to the 0 power, which is 1. And so if the... Um, if we want that that slope of the tangent line to match for our polynomial approximation, then um, <clears throat> then that polynomial approximation, um, if we take the derivative of this expression, we can find the derivative of the polynomial approximation. So taking the derivative of this expression, the derivative of a sub zero is zero. The derivative of this equals a sub one, and we want we want those two to match. You know, not only do we want the value to match, but we want the derivatives to match. So um, the, we want the value of the derivative at zero to be actually the value of the function at zero. Uh, the, the value of the, the derivative of the function at zero, and so we want that to be one, um, and so. Um, if the value of the function is 1, then a sub 1 must be the value 1. So the first degree of polynomial approximation should look like uh, a sub 0 plus a sub 1x, which would look like 1 plus 1x. So if we come back here and we graph... We come back here and uh, let's get our e to the x back here. Okay, we graph this linear approximation 1 plus 1x. We can see that there's the there's e to the x and here is 1 plus 1x. So we can see that um, <clears throat> Let's kind of zoom in a little bit here. Uh, we can see that that linear approximation um, is matching the uh, the the exact function, but it only matches the exact function in this one spot here. Uh, after that, the uh, the linear approximation starts to diverge from the actual value, and as we get farther and farther away from zero, we can see that um, if here's the actual value at, you know, roughly If, uh, if we, you know, if here's the actual value at 2, so that would be f of 2, um, we can see that the approximation here at 2, um, the approximation at 2 of our first degree polynomial is really far off. 
So, you know, it's not that good of an approximation. <clears throat> so now what we do then is we say, well, if a line isn't sufficient for the approximation, let's try a higher degree polynomial. Let's try a, um, a second degree polynomial instead of a first degree polynomial. So we, we're, we're going to look at this and we're going to say, well, you know, we know that the common term for a second degree polynomial is a quadratic. So here's our basic quadratic form. And um, if our first degree polynomial here, our p1 of x, isn't accurate, let's try a p2 of x. So we're going to have to, you know, go through the same steps here. We want to match the value. We want, we want to make sure that the value of the function, um, that the value of the function at 0 matches the value of the polynomial approximation at 0, our, our p2. Um, and, um, and we know that that value needs to be 1 from the uh, from the um, information up here. Um, we want to match our slope. So we know that our, whoops, um, the, we know that the value of the derivative at zero should match the value of the derivative of the approximation at zero uh, for our second degree polynomial. And we, we know that that is our A1 and that has to be equal to a value of 1 from up here. But we also want to match the curvature, you know, the slope of the slope. In other words, this has kind of got a positive curvature here, uh, and we want our approximation to have a positive curvature here. So when we take a look at that, that is matching the, if we're matching the curvature, we're matching the, the second derivative. So we want the, the that second derivative. So if we look at if we look at the expression then for a second degree polynomial, it looks like this. We need to take, we need to get the second derivative for that. And so um, if, uh, if we go ahead then and we have to differentiate that twice, um, I'll go ahead and, and do that in two steps here. So. Um, we're going to find the first derivative. I'm going to put that over here and matching the slope. So the first derivative um, of the polynomial expression is going to look like taking the derivative of this. So that's uh, that's 0. Um, a sub 1x, the derivative is a sub 1. The derivative of this equals 2a sub 2x. And then finding the second derivative of that Um, so taking the derivative of this, this should, this should be a plus. Uh, taking the derivative of this, we get um, 2a sub 2. And so that's got to match <clears throat> the value of the derivative, the second derivative of the function. And the second derivative of the function at 0 is taking the derivative of e to the x two times. And that's still e to the x. So we're still getting the value of 1. And so that means that these two need to be equal to each other. So when we set those two things equal to each other, we get an a2 equal to a half. And so that sets up this polynomial expression to be 1 plus 1x uh, plus a half x squared. And so that quadratic would be a pretty nice approximation. Um, for for this non-polynomial function. So if we type in that, 1 plus 1x plus half x squared, and we graph that, now we can see that we have <coughs> um, this approximation here, which is matching a little bit better. Um, it seems to follow a little bit, you know, farther along. It's it's not just matching closely at um, at a particular point, but it's it's matching pretty closely from maybe 
this location to maybe that location. So if we kind of are consistent here and looking at f of 2, um, f of 2 looks to be about Let me just regraph this so I grab the right one here. Um, that's e to the x. That's the linear approximation. And here comes the quadratic, and the quadratic is the one that is farther out that way. That makes a lot of sense. So if we look at f of 2, um, f of 2 is about right here. Um, and if we come down to the quadratic approximation, there's our P2 of 2. Um, you can see that that polynomial approximation is much closer than this linear approximation. So as we can see, this curve is starting to get closer and closer to the actual e to the x um, function. In fact, I'm going to take this e to the x function and make it a wide function so that we can keep track of which one's the actual function and which one's the approximation. So um, a quadratic is getting closer to that value. Um, and so naturally, if you want to get closer even yet, we, we are going to continue to increase the, uh, the, um, the polynomial degree. So now we're going to look at a third degree polynomial. <clears throat> and if we look at a third degree polynomial, um, you know, not only are we wanting to match the value and the slope and the curvature, but we want to match the next derivative, which is that, um, that third derivative. Um, and this is why we picked e to the x, because taking the derivative of e to the x is, is really, you know, a, a quick process, right? We start with e to the x, and we get our first derivative which is still e to the x, and we get our second derivative, which is still e to the x, and we can get our third derivative. So, um, so coming back from the, old, uh, the previous tables, we know that our a sub 0 is going to have to equal 1. Uh, we know that our a sub 1 has to equal 1. We know that our a sub 2 has to equal a half. And then looking at this, um, Looking at the general form for a, a cubic, we're going to have to um, match the value of that cubic to the value of the third derivative. And so um, if we look at that value of the third derivative, um, we know that um, the th third derivative of x is still e to the x. And if we want that third derivative at 0, then that's still a value of 1. And so um, we just kind of scooch these up a little bit so we can do some calculus here. So um, if this is our polynomial approximation for a third degree polynomial, then um, the derivative of that, our first derivative, looks like um, a sub 1 plus 2a sub 2x plus 3a sub 3x squared. Um, our second derivative for a third degree polynomial looks like taking the derivative of this. So that's 2a sub 2 and then bringing down the power 6a sub 3x and our third derivative for this approximation, taking the derivative of this, we get 6a sub 3. Um, and that value we want to be equal 1. We want to match the value of the third derivative of the approximation to the value of the third derivative of the function, which tells us that a sub 3 then has to be 1 sixth. So we're looking at this then, and we have 1 plus 1x plus half x squared plus one sixth x to the third. And so coming back here then and looking at that uh, one plus one x plus 
half x <coughs> squared plus, now I have to get a 1 sixth in there, 1 divides 6, uh, x to the third power. So here's our third degree polynomial. And as we graph that, here it comes in, and it's going to just squeeze between um, here and here, and it's, it's squeezing so close that you can't even distinguish it from the actual function at this point. Um, so if we, uh, let me see if we blow that up, if we can actually see that it's, well, it's, getting, it's getting really tough to tell. Um, so when we take a look at our P2 now, so 1, 2, here's our P2. <coughs> uh, here's the value of our, excuse me, and our P2. I, I said that wrong. Um, there's the value of our function, e, e, e to the e squared, our function at 2 which equals e squared. Um, then if we take a look at the third degree polynomial, it's tucked right in here. So now if we take a look at that, those two values are really, because um, this is our p3 here, um, those two functions are really close in value. So as we get to that higher and higher degree polynomial, we get something that's more and more accurate. And at this point, you might be able to see, start to see a pattern. Um, we, uh, we start out with x to the first power, and if I just would put this in fraction form, we could put that 1 over 1 here to see what's in the denominator. x to the second power over 2, x to the third power over 6. <clears throat> and so um, if you kind of look at the pattern then after that, what has a 1, 2, 6 pattern um, and that happens to be the, uh, the factorial, and factorials would be a big part of this, this next unit here. So we're looking at uh, a P4 then of 1 plus 1x plus, I'm going to write it in a little bit better pattern look, x squared over 2 factorial, x cubed over 3 factorial, because 3 factorial is 3 times 2 times 1, which is 6. And then our, so our fourth degree approximation would be x to the fourth over 4 factorial. And our fifth degree approximation then would be <clears throat> taking that and adding another term. Uh, our fifth degree approximation would be x to the fifth over 5 factorial. So at this point, if I wanted to look at, um, if I wanted to look at the tables at this point, um, for E2, right, we're looking at those tables there for E squared, all right, E to the first powers is Euler's number 2.718, E squared is about 7.3. We can see that linear approximation Oops. Um, we can see those approximations. Okay, that's all we have. So if we take a look at these approximations, these up a bit. Uh, <coughs> if we uh, if we look at these approximations, here's our linear. This is our p1. Um, this is our linear approximation. Um, so uh, excuse me, that's our linear approximation. Um, this is our function e to the x. This is our linear approximation, our p1. This is our quadratic, p2, and this is our cubic, p3. We can see that um, yeah, our linear approximation, this is our 1 plus 1x 
right? So um, at for p squared, um, for in other words, for an x of a value of two, one plus one times two is three. So e squared is about seven point three eight nine one. Our linear approximation gets us three. It's pretty far away. Our quadratic gets us five, right? That was the one plus x plus half x squared. So when we talk about plugging in two here, um, that's four. That's half of four is two, plus two more is four, plus one more is five. So we're getting closer. We've gone from three to five. This is just the value of x again. Um, and then our cubic gets us to 6.33. So we keep getting closer and closer to this actual value the farther we go out on those polynomials. So this one we might have to go out to a, a P7 or a P8 to get real accurate. So as we look at um, the, uh, just looking at the graph here is a little better graph. So, um, and we look at that P2 here, we can see <clears throat> that, um, just get a line drawn here. Um, there we go. So if we look at our P2 here, we can see, you know, here is the value of the function, which is 7.3891. So that's 7.3891. Um, our linear approximation was down here at 3. Our quadratic approximation was up here at 5. Our cubic approximation was up here, I think that was 6.333. Yeah, 6.333. <clears throat> okay, so as we increase the degree, um, we, uh, we, definitely increase, er, we definitely get more and more accurate to the actual value, and that's the whole idea of these Taylor polynomials, or Maclaurin polynomials, is that we, uh, we, we express them out far enough to get pretty accurate. This is still pretty far away, still a high degree of error, but um, it's only a third degree polynomial. So if we take a look at that, um, you know, that third degree polynomial, 1 plus 1x plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x cubed over 3 factorial. We're going to start to see a, a pattern fall out of this. Um, if we take a look at our um, P4, then we're taking a look at this. And um, we're adding on our fourth degree expression. Um, and and so as we start to take a look at that pattern um, here uh, <clears throat> here in this here we have a seventh degree approximation um, I've kind of written it in a way where hopefully you can see a, a little better pattern here uh, we've already acknowledged that these are factorials and so if we take a look at this one a p7 it's a seventh degree polynomial. Um, as we look at the seventh degree polynomial, we see that we have seven factorial in the denominator. So that's our first. That's our first pattern. Um, that we can see that our our factorial in the denominator matches our degree. And that was that's consistent here as well. 
right, a third degree polynomial approximation. Our, our highest denominator was a third degree polynomial. Fourth degree, the highest denominator was a fourth degree polynomial. Um, <clears throat> if we um, if we look at then the numerators, the numerator for this one is always the value one. Well, what was always equaling the value one? That was the derivative. That's why we picked e to the x to begin with, uh, because it has an easy derivative. The first derivative, this is our um, this is our f prime of x was 1. The second derivative, our f double prime of x, was also 1. The third derivative, our f triple prime of x, is still 1. And so this numerator represents all of these derivatives um, of, the, of the actual function. And then our power here also matches also matches the, the degree of the polynomial there. And so that really is what falls into a pattern and allows us to calculate these polynomial approximations a lot quicker than the activities that we've done uh, up to this point. And <clears throat> we've done this, we, we approximated um, P5 of 2, or excuse me, not P5, P3 of 2. Um, so we're going to skip this. Our P3 of 2 was that 6.333. Um, if we go out to a seventh degree polynomial, we'll see that that's really, really super close. But here comes here comes our um, our uh, our information then that we need to calculate um, Maclaurin polynomials really fast is looking at this pattern and seeing that the numerator is always the derivative of the function. The power on the x for the degree of the polynomial matches the degree of the approximation, and the denominator has this factorial sort of pattern. So if we go back to that um, pattern we saw in the activity um, for sine of x, uh, we started out with a fifth degree polynomial, um, which is this right here in the green. Um, <clears throat> so that's your P5. Um, here is your third degree polynomial. So here's your P3. Um, so this purple one here, uh, the black one here is your linear one. So here's your P1. Okay, so we've got our P1, we've got our P3, 1, 2, 3, we've got our P5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And so this purple one here, 1, this purple one right here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 is our P7. So that's that purple one here is our P7. And so <clears throat> as we look at this and see if this kind of matches this pattern here, um, you know, we see our, our linear approximation, that's the black one. We see our third degree polynomial, that's our blue one. Our fifth degree is our green one. And then the seventh degree is the purple one. So if we, if we think about that pattern where we look at the terms and the numerator is the derivative, the denominator is the factorial, um, and then the power of the uh, x has to match the power of the approximation. If we start talking about taking the derivatives here, so if we start out with f of x, the derivative of uh, sine of x is cosine of x. Um, the derivative of that is minus sine x. Uh, the next derivative is minus cosine x. Um, and the next derivative, I'm going to start using numbers here instead of hash marks. 
is um, back to sinex, um, and then we can we can keep you know finding the values of the derivative here, um, the values of <coughs> the uh, the fifth. Um, fifth derivative is cosine x, so it's kind of the pattern starts over again. The sixth derivative is minus sine x. Um, seventh derivative is minus cosine x. So if we think about all those derivatives and those being all the numerators, then um, we can kind of see that it does in fact fit that pattern. I'm going to start with the first derivative because the first derivative is um, is located right here with the first power term. And so that first derivative, if we're going to evaluate this at 0, because we're talking about centering this at the value 0, the cosine of 0 is 1. So there's the value of that derivative. So that one matches. Um, Let's talk about the next term here. The next term is the third degree um, polynomial term. So the third degree polynomial term lines up with the third degree derivative. So the third degree derivative here is minus cosine x. So minus cosine of 0 is a minus 1, which matches up with this derivative being negative 1. So that matches up. Uh, if we look at the next term here, it's the fifth degree polynomial term. So we have to look at the fifth derivative. And that fifth derivative is the derivative of cosine x evaluated at 0, which gives us our 1 back again. And the seventh derivative <coughs> is opposite cosine x. And so when we evaluate that at 0, we get a minus 1, which gets us that also back. So the odd derivatives check. So let's talk now about the even derivatives. The even derivatives would be this. This is the 0th derivative. And so when we take a look at the 0th term, that's the term that is out in front of the first term. That's the x to the 0 power. So the value... Um, of the function at 0, sine of 0 is 0. So if we have a coefficient of 0 out here, then that whole term drops out, which is why you don't see the term. When we talk about the second derivative, so that checks out, the second derivative um, would be where the second term, the, the second power term would be. And so if you notice again, the second derivative goes back to being that sine function. So the second derivative is going to be opposite sine of 0, and the sine of 0 is still 0. So what happens with these even terms is that with the trig function, these even terms are starting to drop out because they have coefficients of 0. So for the, um, for the function sine of x, we start to see just this odd pattern uh, arise. Um, and so all the even patterns are, are falling out. This would be 0x to the 0 over 0 factorial. And this even term here would be 0x squared over 2 factorial. And this would be 0x to the 4th over 4 factorial. So those are starting to drop out. Um, and so we see sine x as this... this um, this polynomial approximation of, of um, a collection of odd terms. So to evaluate for pi over 2, so the value of the 7th degree polynomial at pi over 2. So when we're talking about pi over 2, we're talking about one, you know, about 1.57. So we're talking about, you know, at, at that peak pretty much right there on the sine curve. And we can see that those, all those values are, are really close. Um, certainly the fifth degree polynomial is real close. Um, the seventh degree polynomial, you really can't even distinguish it from the red at all. Um, the third degree polynomial is pretty far away. 
Um, so if we used <clears throat> uh, this approximation to approximate pi over 2, then what we would, be, we would be doing is we'd be saying that oh, that's pi over 2 um, minus 1 sixth pi over 2 to the third power plus 1 one 120th pi over 2 to the fifth power minus 1 over 5040 pi over 2 to the seventh power. Okay, and so we need to, if we calculate that, you know, what do we get for, um, for that value? So if we calculate that, um, let's get our graphic calculator back here. Um, if we calculate that, we've got um, pi divide 2 minus quantity pi divide 2 cubed divided by 6 plus quantity pi divide 2 to the <clears throat> fifth power divided by 120 uh, minus quantity pi divided by 2 to the seventh power divided by 5040. Okay, so you got pi divided by 2 minus pi divided by 2 cubed over 6 plus pi divided by 2 to the 5th over 120 minus pi divided by 2 to the 7th over 5040. And so we get that. And so we have an approximation here of 0.99984, so pretty darn close to 1. Um, and so we can see that uh, we, with only 1, 2, 3, 4 terms, um, we can get a pretty accurate approximation for sine of pi over 2. Um, so as we go into the remaining sections, um, remaining pieces of this of this section, uh, we're going to really learn how to get these polynomial approximations in a quick fashion um, without doing all of the uh, all of the all of the um, processes that we did for the uh, the activities. So here is a similar function um, that we're going to derive a Maclaurin polynomial um, for. And, uh, and here we have f of x equals e to the 3x. And so we, we, we've already discussed a fair amount about f of x um, being e to the x. And all the derivatives then also being e to the x. And so we got that pattern of the derivatives. If we evaluate this at 0, the derivative is always equal to 1. In this situation, when we take the derivative, we have a chain rule here. So the derivative value changes. So we're going to expect the numerator to change as well. So if we go back to this pattern that we discussed here, where we saw that as we wrote out this polynomial, the numerators were all the derivatives. The power matched the degree of the approximation, and the denominators were all the factorials. That's really the pattern we have to clue into when, um, when generating these polynomial approximations. So that comes up then as the definition of the nth Taylor polynomial. In other words, that is how we define writing our polynomials. We define them by saying that the derivatives are all in the numerator. So here's the zeroth derivative. Remember, the zeroth derivative is just the function itself. So here's the zeroth derivative, the first derivative, the second derivative, the third derivative, and so on. Okay, and um, and then all the bottoms are factorials. So if we would look at the denominator here, the zeroth factorial is equal to one. 
the first factorial is equal to 1, which is why they're not written there. There's the second factorial, and so on. Um, <clears throat> if we um, if we center them at 0, that's what we define as a Maclaurin polynomial, um, which is all we've talked about so far. The Maclaurin polynomials are all evaluated at 0. Okay. Um, we can evaluate polynomials at other locations other than the other than x equals zero but um, all we've talked about so far is defining these things for x equal to zero so for this um, and and getting these polynomial approximations really isn't too difficult it's a matter of calculating all the derivatives that we need and then plugging them into that basic uh, that basic form so we want a Maclaurin polynomial of degree five um, for this function. So we know we have a degree 5. <clears throat> That's what we want to find, which means we have to take 5 derivatives. So we're just going to go ahead and set up our 5 derivatives here. I'm going to start using numbers here instead of hash marks again. Okay, so this is the zeroth derivative. The first derivative is going to be 3e to the 3x. Um, the second derivative is going to be 3 times 3, which is 9e to the 3x. Uh, the next derivative is going to be 27e to the 3x. The next derivative is going to be 81e to the 3x. And the last derivative is going to be uh, 81 times 3, which is 243e to the 3x. Okay, so there are the first five derivatives. And we have to, this is a Maclaurin, so we have to evaluate them for an x value of 0. So when we plug in 0 here, uh, that would be 3 times 0. That's going to be 3. And when we plug in 0 here, e to the 0, it's going to leave us with 9. Uh, and that's going to leave us with 27, 81, and 243. So you can see how quickly we can get the numerators. These will all be found in the numerator uh, when we build our approximations. Okay. So to build that P5 then, a polynomial approximation of, deg of degree 5, um, we're going to start with the, the value for the 0th derivative. So the value for the 0th derivative is e to the 0, which is 1. So just kind of a little aside here. Uh, f of 0 is e to the 0 equals 1. So, um, and then we have the first derivative, which is 3x. So we have 1 plus 3x plus the next derivative, which is 9. 9 over 2 factorial x squared um, plus the next derivative. When, so this, we're in the dot, dot, dot here. So the next derivative is 27 over 3 factorial <clears throat> x cubed. Then the next derivative plus 81 over 4 factorial x to the fourth plus the last derivative 243 over 5 factorial x to the fifth. Uh, let me scoot this over so I have room to write x to the fifth. x to the fifth. So there is, um, there's our fifth degree polynomial, um, Maclaurin polynomial, because it's centered at zero. That means we have just the x terms here. Okay, so we evaluated the derivatives all at zero, got our numerators. There's our 1, 3, 9, 27, 81, 43. 1, 3, 9, 27, 81, 2, 43. Uh, there are all our, our factorials in the denominator. Just to kind of recap, we could have written this over 0 factorial and over 1 factorial, just that those happen to be a value of 1, so we didn't write them in the original expression. 
Um, so there's your polynomial approximation. We could calculate now um, any value of e to the 3x. So, you know, if we would graph e to the 3x, um, graphing e to the 3x would look like e to the power 3 times x. So this is going to get really big really fast because the power is multiplied by 3 each time. So this is going to shoot up vertically really fast. There we go. And so there's e to the 3x. So if we wanted to calculate e cubed, which would be a value of x equals 1, we could calculate the value of e cubed. So for, um, for x equal to 1, the function would be e to the 3 times 1, which would be e cubed. And e cubed is <clears throat> 20.086. Um, then this polynomial approximation should be pretty close to that. So in that polynomial, oops, in that polynomial approximation, that fifth degree approximation, we are approximating the value uh, for e cubed, and e cubed, remember, is a value for when x equals 1. x equals 1, 1, to the, it's 1 times 3 is 3, that's e to the third power. So that means our polynomial approximation is going to be plugging in the value 1 to this polynomial approximation. Um, so when we plug that in to that polynomial approximation, um, we end up with a value of um, uh, a value of 1 plus 3 plus 9 over 2 factorial, that's <clears throat> 9 divided by 2, and 1 to the second power is still 1, so plus 27 divided by 6 plus 81 divided by 4 factorial is 24. Um, plus 243 divided by 5 factorial, which is 120. Um, so when we add all that up together, we get 18.4, um, which is pretty close to the 20.086 uh, for the actual value. So this is, would be our approximation, our approximation of, with a fifth degree polynomial. Uh, for this example, we have sine of pi x, and we are looking at a uh, polynomial of degree 3. So we need to get the first three derivatives out here. So I'm going to go ahead and say the zeroth derivative of x is just sine of pi x. Um, the first derivative of x is taking the derivative of this, which would be pi cosine pi x. Uh, the second derivative of x would be taking the derivative of this. So the derivative of this would be pi times pi, which I'm going to call pi squared, um, sine pi x with a minus out front because the derivative of cosine is opposite sine. And then for the third derivative, um, that's going to be pi cubed cosine pi x. Um, and the derivative of opposite sine is opposite cosine. So <clears throat> there are um, your derivatives up to the third derivative. And so to come up with this third degree approximation, we're going to have um, the, the, the zeroth derivative so that we have to evaluate that at zero for our... Um, for our Maclaurin polynomial. So uh, sine of pi times 
times zero is going to be zero. Uh, pi cosine of pi times zero is going to be pi. Um, opposite pi squared sine of pi times zero is going to be zero. And opposite pi cubed cosine of pi times zero is going to be opposite of pi cubed. So there are the values of the derivatives. So um, for the zeroth term, if we have the derivative of zero, x to the zero over zero factorial, that's this term. And then we can bring in our first term here, which is a positive pi x to the first over 1 factorial. Remember, you don't have to write these two things here, 0 factorial, 1 factorial. Um, and then we have this next term, which is plus 0x squared over 2 factorial. And then we have the next term, minus pi cubed x cubed over 3 factorial. So if we get rid of the stuff that ends up being 0, we're left with then the third degree approximation for sine of x, which is pi x um, minus pi cubed x cubed over 3 factorial. So we can kind of see here that um, <clears throat> that um, when we're talking about sine of pi x, um, that uh, when we compare that to compare that to just sine of x, where sine of x's approximation was um, where sine of x's approximation was just the um, the um, x minus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the 5th over 5 factorial minus x to the 7th over 7 factorial. Um, there's, there's an example of the, p, of the 7th degree approximation. Uh, you notice that when we have sine of pi x, we get the, the uh, pi uh, to the first power, pi to the third power, pi to the fifth power, pi to the seventh power. So we've got that pi to the, uh, the power that matches the degree of the polynomial because of the fact that all these derivatives here have, uh, have a multiple of pi in them. So we have a pi to kind of the nth power uh, in each one of those terms. Um, for that approximation to be representative of sine pi x.